Dear Heavenly Gracious God, as we come before your holy presence, we ask your forgiveness for each and every known sin that's in our lives. And we thank you for what Jesus Christ did at the cross of Calvary for each one of us. As we enter the message, we ask you to allow your Holy Spirit to take it and make it real, make it real unto the listeners, and continue to make it real for my life. In Jesus' name, we ask you and thank you. Amen. Welcome back to Challenges of Faith radio program. I'm Gary McCance. Thank you for joining. So, part three of how many times? And if you've been following, and I know you have, parts one and two, we're opening up in chapter four of the book of Jonah in verse one. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Wait a minute. <clears throat> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And I'm sure that there's somebody listening that can identify <clears throat> with Jonah. Jonah obeyed God, and his work was done. You know, it's similar to when you finally obey God and witness or do for someone that God called you to do for and not yourself or others called you to do it. So why was Jonah or you so angry? Now, God has more problems with this backsliding prophet than he had with the entire population of Nineveh. Do you notice that? I mean, why was Jonah displeased? Think about it. If I'd been in Jonah's shoes, maybe you. And if I'd been in Jonah's fish, maybe I may have felt the same way Jonah did. But the scripture gives us some insight into the heart of Jonah. You know it does. Remember? So he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish. Now, you know, there's, if you've done your research, I know you have, then you've noticed that there's been some commentators who said that the reason Jonah acted is if he did. And you know he did because <clears throat> we're reading it. But let's go off what the commentators are saying. <clears throat> they're alleging that he really didn't know God. That's what they're saying. But when you look in the word, do you notice how Jonah makes it clear that the problem is that he did know God? Listen to him in verse 2 of chapter 4. For I know that you are gracious and merciful, God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. You you can probably say the same thing, can you not? I can. You've heard me say, and the number keep going up, 20 billion times of our gracious and merciful God. And brethren of the household of faith, we don't have any conception of how gracious and merciful our God is and how he longs to save. But you see, and I know you do, he's a holy God. And you notice how he's made one way for you and I, men and women, women and men, to be saved. And when you look at Acts chapter 4, verse 12, I know you wrote it down. Remember the apostle Peter, when speaking of our Savior, said, There's no other name under heaven given among men, applicable to ladies too, by which we must be saved. Do you notice he didn't say anything about your name, my name, your pastor's name, your imam's name, your rabbi's name, your priest's name, your human teacher's name, this person and the love of money, the love of materialism, the love of title, the love of power, the lack thereof. Did you notice he didn't say that's how you're going to be saved? Do you notice that? And that's the message that got to be given out if people are to experience the mercy of God and know the grace of God like you do and I do. 
Because apart from Jesus Christ, a scary, awful eternity is waiting for every single person. Think about it. And it would be before us today if Christ had not borne that judgment death for you and I upon the cross. Thank you, Lord. But do you notice that Jonah says, you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant. And loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. In other words, when God called Jonah to go to Nineveh and speak to that city and tell them that because of their evil, their wickedness, that God would destroy them, Jonah knew what would happen. Jonah knew what would happen. Remember now, the Ninevites were evil people. And you talking about violence and wickedness and lawlessness in your country? In your province, in your village, in my country, county, in the neighborhoods, none of fights. That's all they were about. It was a dreaded and feared in the ancient world. Think about it. When the Assyrian army moved against the city, sometimes the entire population of the community would commit suicide rather than fall into the hands of those Assyrians. So Jonah knew God was merciful and, and he would save even Ninevites. Think about it. <laughs> it's not even funny. Jonah says, in effect, I don't trust those Ninevites. They might claim to turn to God and then don't do it. Or they might sincerely turn to God. And if they do, God will save them. Think about it. Jonah didn't want those Ninevites to be saved, so that's why he went in the opposite direction. Maybe that's you. But you notice God gave him a second chance to do his will. You notice how God detoured him around and sent him to Nineveh despite his mindset, you know, where the battle takes place. So Jonah's finished his assignment. Listen to him. Listen to his prayer in in Jonah chapter 4, verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. (laughs) It's not funny, because maybe that's where you are or have been, so you can identify. But at this point, Jonah is the most unhappy person on the earth, don't you think? You think you're miserable? And you, and you, and you, here you got Jonah. He's unhappy. But wait a minute. Let's come back to you. Maybe you are. Maybe you're the most miserable and unhappy person in society today as a believer of the house of the faith. And the reason why you are, have you ever thought that maybe it's because you're out of the will of God? Have you ever thought about that? You know, the founder of Moody Bible Institute, Dwight L. Moody, he said that <clears throat> some people have just enough religion to make them miserable and other people may have actually be saved but are certainly not enjoying the ride to heaven. Neither are they being used of God. Are you being used of God today? Are you miserable? Here you got Jonah, God's man. Look at him. Again, God had more trouble with this backsliding prophet than he did with the entire city of Nineveh. But guess what? God was going to work on his prophet. Is God working on you today? You see, God's method with Jonah may still be his method today with you and me and me and you. You know why? Because he knows our frame. Because he remembers that we are dust. Remember over in Psalm chapter 103, verse 14, you know, and when you mix dust and water together, since you think you got it going on with your nice outfit on, and there's nothing wrong with wearing a nice outfit, your nice hairstyle, there's nothing wrong with that. Your nice overt appearance, there's nothing wrong with that. Nice shoes, nice vehicle, nice place with a roof of your head and all of that. There's nothing wrong with that. But have you forgotten when you mix dust and water together, what it becomes? Mud, dirt. 
God knows us. And he knew Jonah. Think about it, our loving and merciful God. He understands our human nature, especially that fallen human nature. He understands this old nature that you and I inherited from Adam when he rebelled against God. And you keep hearing me say, you know, think about that. Those of you who are loving parents or mentors or whoever you happen to be, and you look at that little baby because you forgot all about yourself. When you was a little baby and your parents or whoever raised you told you not to do something, you did it anyway, little old sinner. But listen to the Lord's response to Jonah in Jonah chapter 4, verse 4. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? And continue on to verse 5. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter. Think about what Jonah's doing. He doesn't like what God said to him. He's out of fellowship with God. He doesn't have a friend in that city of Nineveh. How about you? And on top of that, his home was several hundred miles away. He wants to go home. He's lonely. But you notice this is the time when God is going to move in on his man. Do you notice that? So here you got Jonah. Think about it. Maybe that's you. Here you got Jonah. He made a little shelter living in outside the city. You know, he may have went up on a hill, which was the protection for the city, and he wanted to get a nice seat at an elevation where he could look out over the city and tend to stay there until the fire fell from heaven because he didn't believe that none of us were sincere. How about that person in your life that you've already been judged, you've already condemned? And you act like they're not sincere. You don't even give them a chance to fall down and get up. You put your both of your feet, your whole body, sledgehammers on their head and on their shoulders. Here Jonah knows God. Here, Jonah knows that God is merciful to save the Ninevites. He also knows God's going to judge them if they're not genuine. And Jonah is so sure that they're going to go back to their old sins. (laughs) It's not funny. He's out there waiting. Think about you. You can't wait for that person over there, that person over there, that person over there, that believer of the house of the faith to fall. But you got this, here you got this lonely, backsliding prophet. So unhappy. He liked to die. So Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat under the shade so he could see what would become of the city. Well, wait a minute. And the Lord God prepared a plant. You know, in some versions it's called a gourd. And made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his mercy. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. And you can see that in verses 5 and 6 of Jonah chapter 4. Now, here you got this plant that God prepared. You didn't prepare it because if you prepare it, you, you, you take credit for it. But here you got this plant, this gourd vine. It's as miraculous as the fish. Remember the fish that God prepared? Remember? Now, here you got the gourd prepared by God. You notice how one is just as miraculous as the other? Now you got Jonah. Now all of a sudden Jonah becomes attached to that little old gourd plant. Remember, it was God who made this gourd sprout up and grow. Jonah didn't have anything living that he could communicate with. Remember that? Sitting there all lonely and unhappy. Maybe that's you. Wherever you happen to be, you're lonely, you're unhappy, you're miserable. You're making everybody else miserable. But he wanted to communicate with somebody or something because that's the way God made us. And it's interesting how we can get attached to a living thing. But Jonah became attached to the gourd that God had arranged all this purposely. And you notice as the morning dawned the next day, God prepared a warm. And you can turn to Jonah chapter 4, verse 7 through 8, because I know you're going to read alone. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a warm. And it damaged the plant that it withered. 
And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. So here we have here in the book of Jonah a prepared fish, a prepared gourd, a prepared warm, and a prepared vehement east wind. And do you notice how all of them are equally miraculous? Do you notice that? You see how God is dealing with his man? You see how God is dealing with you and me and me and you that belong to him? Jonah had lost his gourd vine, the little living thing to which he had become attached. It's dead now. And he's grieving over it because it's the only living thing he had. How many people have a gourd? To which you're giving your time, your energy, your money, everything. And what is it really? What is it? You know, the story <clears throat> is told about a lady. Could have been a man, but it happens to be a lady. Her husband had died. She was lonely, unhappy, miserable. And she thought about it that her husband had a friend who owned a pet store. And so to help her out with her miserableness, her loneliness, and her unhappiness, she went to her husband's friend's pet store. And she wanted a pet that she could communicate with. So her husband's friend sold her a very expensive parakeet, let her know that the parakeet could talk and do all these things. Home, and after week one, she went back to the store, and she complained, said the parakeet wasn't talking. The owner convinced her that the parakeet would and sold her a very expensive exercise machine, letting her know that after the parakeet exercise, he would he or she as a parakeet would truly talk. Week two went by, same complaint. Owner sold her some other things, saying that the parakeet needed a mirror while the parakeet was exercising to look at himself. Week three came in, the lady was crying, letting the owner know that her parakeet had died. The owner said, die? She said, yes. The owner said, well, the things that I sold you, did the parakeet ever do those things? She said, yes. And he never said anything? No. So the owner said, let me ask you another question. When the parakeet was dying, did it ever say anything to you? So the lady thought about it for a second. And she really thought, and she said, you know what? It did. Wow. And the owner said, well, or the pet store said, well, what did the parakeet say while I was lying there dying to you? She said, well, as the parakeet was lying there dying, it motioned for me to come near. She said, and I did. And the owner all excitedly wanted to know. I don't know why he was excited that the parakeet was dying, but let's go back to the story. So the owner wanted to know all excitedly, well, what did the parakeet say? And the lady said, well, while the parakeet was lying there dying and motioning for me to come near, the parakeet said, listen, in a whispering term, the store that you purchase all those items from, she said, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. The parakeet said, listen, did they ever have any food down there? So, how many people have a gourd <clears throat> to which you're giving your time, your energy, your money, everything? And what is it really? Listen to how God is now speaking to Jonah in verse 9. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, is it right for me to be angry even to death? 
In other words, Jonah said, this is it. I want to die. You didn't destroy none of it, but you did destroy my gourd. It's a petulant little prophet, isn't it? You know he is. He's got a lot of critical saints today. Now think about the lady. She did everything, expected everything from that parakeet, but shouldn't she have given the parakeet some food? But here you got God. Look what he's doing for Jonah. He's got a gourd. They don't want anybody to take the gourd away from him. And how did the Lord respond in verse 10? But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. So here God is showing this man how ridiculous it is. Jonah, a gourd is nothing. Think about it. Think about it. Even that which you may be communicated with, maybe your cat, and I say this respectfully and lovingly, maybe your bird, maybe your dog, maybe these other pets that people have, you know, including the ones they that are illegal to own. But a human being has a soul that is either going to heaven or hell. God didn't ask you to love the lost before you go to them. He let it be known, I love the lost, and I want you to go to them. And this is what he is saying to Jonah. Jonah, I love the Ninevites. And then verse 11, and should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left? And much livestock? And the question you got to ask and answer, who does he mean by 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left? He means little children. God said, you wouldn't want me to destroy that city, would you, Jonah? If you can fall in love with a gourd vine, can't you at least fall in love with Ninevite children? God is saying to people today, I want you to go and take the word of God to those who are lost believers of the household of faith. And you say, but but I don't love them. God says, I never asked you to love them. I asked you to go. I can't find anywhere that God ever asked Jonah to go because he loved the Ninevites. He said, Jonah, I want you to go because I love Ninevites. I want to save them. I want you to take the message to them. <clears throat> and since Jonah wrote the book, you know he did. Isn't isn't it when you really look at it reasonable to say that after this experience, he left the dead gourd vine and went to where the living were, walking the streets of Nineveh? And I believe he rejoiced with them that they had come to a saving knowledge of God. you talking about a powerful message. So let me ask you a question. You don't mind, do you? Why don't you get involved in getting the word of God out to people? You know, the Great Commission. Don't be motivated by things that are emotional. And while you're presenting the word of God to them, do it because God loves them. And if you do it that way, guess what? You'll learn to love them as well. Have you thought about that? My brethren of the household of faith, you sure? <laughs>